this again uh, was as an event that is sponsored uh, specifically tonight by the Africa Study Center. Um, again, there's uh, six area study centers uh, at, housed at UNC. Some of them are consortiums with uh, Duke. Um, I uh, work at the European Studies Center. Uh, we will be sponsoring an event uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, tonight's brought to you by the African Study Centers as each of us has been uh, taking turns um, sponsoring an event uh, for tonight. So uh, if you have a particular interest uh, in Africa, African diaspora, um, and want additional information, great resources uh, that are available, lesson plans. Uh, they have this uh, great new grant through uh, the Oak Foundation that they've been working on uh, developing lesson plans. Please reach out to uh, our colleagues at African Studies. Um, I will momentarily turn it over to uh, Laura, um, who uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, zooming in all the way from London. Um, Laura Cox is a PhD candidate uh, in history here uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, she's both a Royster and Fulbright Hayes doctoral dissertation research abroad fellow. Uh, and her research, part of which she'll be sharing with tonight, centers on South African women exiles uh, in global coalition building during the anti-apartheid movement, examining how activists negotiated, challenged, or operated within different forms of racial and gender stratification. Um, so with that, I believe I am going to stop my screen share and make sure, Laura, that you are a have the screen share capacity. Do you have that capacity? Because I'm it looks like it. I'm sure. sharing right now. There's going to awesome. be the obligatory pause as I do this. Is that all centered? right? Start then I will go ahead and mute myself both with audio and video to make sure you've got what you need. Thank you so much, Laura. Great. No, thank you for the fabulous introduction um, there for me, John. Uh, and so hopefully all of you can see my slide right now. Um, I first just thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I first just want to say thank you to all of you who turned out for a presentation on a Wednesday evening. So Letitia, Pam, Stephanie, John, thank you for facilitating. Um, I'm a, my name's Laura. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate uh, in the history department. Again, I'm in London right now, so I might be a little delirious, uh, have some brain fog. If so, I apologize. Um, but I am really eager to present um, some of this material to you today. And my research is basically reconstructing radical anti-colonial networks in the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and so I have a number of questions I'm gonna be posing today. I think to many of you, the answers might seem obvious, um, but I've designed this presentation for your students and repurposing this content for your students. Uh, so that's basically what I'm hoping this this lecture and this conversation, um, what I hope it will do for you. In the interest of minimizing chaos, um, if you have questions or responses to any of my questions, uh, please put it in the chat. That will be our primary form of communication for today. And if there's something that I miss, John, if you could just interrupt me and let me know if there's a, a question in the chat that I didn't see, that would be, thank you. Um, that would be very helpful. So to start off, um, I'm centering this lecture. We're going to cover a wide swath of material, but I'm centering it around two sets of questions, hopefully to give your students some sort of intellectual focus. Obviously, you can jettison or refine these questions as you want to. But I'm basically asking, you know, what are the leading causes but behind the creation of a, an apartheid state and which strategies were most effective in leading to its demise? The second half is when does South African history resemble the history of other places that your students have studied and when does it diverge? And from a historian's perspective, my intention here is twofold. Uh, the first question is the cause and effect question. Um, the second one is the compare and contrast question and historians do this all the time in their craft. Um, so that's the, the intention behind those. A note on language, um, I think more instructors would benefit from being more specific about the language you do and don't use. Um, I think we often take for granted that students will be conscious of what terms are appropriate or inappropriate. So I just want to cover a few. Um, South African sources often use the term Bantu. Um, it refers to Black South Africans or um, Africans 
this is a derogatory term. Um, it's often what colonialists called Black South Africans. This is different than Bantu languages. Um, we're also going to talk about the Bantu Education Act. But when we're referring to people, just ensure that your students are not reproducing this language in conversation or in their essays. Similarly, um, you'll, he you'll read about indigenous inhabitants um, being called Bushmen or Hottentots. Um, this is also um, derogatory language. Um, it's offensive monikers that European settlers essentially gave to indigenous people. The San people were um, hunter-gatherers, the Khoi Khoi were pastoralists. Um, and so just warn your students that they should not be replicating this sort of language in their, in their writing. The third one um, is something actually college students can also learn from putting the in front of black or white, often reducing people to the race or treating them as objects. Um, you know, just say Black South African, White South African, not the whites or the Blacks. Um, uh, it's just not how we um, speak appropriately. Um, and then the last one is a little bit different than the others, um, because this is contextualizing race, racial terminology. In the United States, we would not describe, we would not call a person colored. Um, that, that is an offensive term. We might say person of color, but colored is not what we say anymore. This is different in South Africa. Colored has a very specific sociolinguistic history. Um, it ultimately refers to mixed race people or essentially you know, the unions between white settlers and indigenous or enslaved populations. Um, and admittedly, it's a vestige of the apartheid era, um, but you will hear people um, refer to themselves as colored in South Africa. Um, it is still very much resonant today. So if someone, one of your students um, describes someone as colored South African, that would be totally appropriate in this context um, in an essay or in conversation. Finally, last thing for your students, um, they just need to know South Africa is a country on the African continent. Um, you'll have many students who think Africa is just a country. It is not. Um, you'll have some who will think South Africa refers to the region. But it is precisely because there's a country called South Africa that the region is Southern Africa. So you can see some of that highlighted there, as well as South Africa in the image. Just some things that I don't think your students will necessarily be aware of that will hopefully be helpful to them. OK, so um, I was going to come up with the word cloud on Poll Everywhere, but Poll Everywhere was quite frankly being a little rude. So we're just going to rely on the chat. Um, but if you could just type in the, what's the first word that comes to mind when you think of South Africa and you can submit twice if you want, you could submit um, the word that comes to your mind, as well as the word you think that will come to your students minds. Um, so let's just spitball in the chat. Yeah, what do you think of when you hear South Africa, the first word. Table Mountain, excellent geographical feature of, of Cape Town, yeah, as well as Lion's Head, if some of you know that as well. I've not hiked Table Mountain because it sounds deeply unpleasant, but I probably should. Um, okay, any other, any other sort of words that come to mind? Let me move this out of here. Diamonds, yes, and we will talk about the um, mineral revolution. Um, a little bit, not death in depth. Okay, any others? Um, any other participants here? Sorry, the, my chat um, is heritage. Oh, that's great. Yes, the heritage of South Africa. It's a very co complex and very diverse heritage. Um, anybody else? Um, okay, that's fine. So. Mandela, yes, there we go, Mandela. When I do this, many students say Mandela. Uh, many people say apartheid, makes sense. Um, so you might ask your students, I know you all know who's the man on the left and you know, this is Nelson Mandela. Um, on the right is Oliver and Adelaide Tombo, two major figures of the anti-apartheid struggle who married in the 50s. Um, I am centering the Tombos for this presentation. Why am I doing that? Um, First of all, the majority of people know who Nelson Mandela is and don't really know any other South African. Um, Trevor Noah is becoming an exception to this, 
But Nelson Mandela, in terms of studying and understanding the, the struggle, has received extensive coverage. So um, I just wanted to center different people because there are a variety of actors through which to tell the story of South African history. Secondly, um, we're talking about a couple. Um, I think a lot of your students will see history as something that's the diplomatic, that's the political, that it's public, but history is also the personal, um, the private, the effective, the intimate. Um, and these are those are valid histories that run alongside the conventional stories we're given. So I also want to center, center the Tambos for that reason. This is also a prime opportunity to ask for students from whose perspective is history usually told? Um, you might introduce the big man concept or that you know it's usually men who are wealthy, typically white, with incredible political, social and economic power. And those are the histories, um, it's from their perspective that we usually learn history. Um, in general, people are privileged um, who have many sources to their names. Um, and sometimes Oliver Tambo can be read as a big man history, but how can we tell his history in a way that um, humanizes him a little more? And lastly, I'm going to refer to Oliver and Adelaide by their first names, just so you know which Tombo I'm referencing. Um, originally, I was gonna go cover a bit of early South African history. We will not have the time. So I'm gonna jump for a second. I'm just gonna jump to something that's critical to understanding South Africa, which is South Africa becomes a settler colonial state. What does that mean? Um, I don't think your students will know exactly what those terms are, but to understand settler colonialism, we also need to understand colonialism and imperialism. That's a little difficult. These definitions change over time and they're very related to each other. For our purposes, uh, colonialism um, is just a foreign power that is exerting direct physical control over a subjugated population. Imperialism is very similar, except those mechanisms are far more indirect, less physical, less on the ground. Settler colonialism, as an extension of colonialism, is a process by which indigenous populations become dispossessed and become displaced by a foreign power. Um, land and resources are appropriated, often to help secure the permanent settlement of that foreign power. And in general, it just disempowers local populations. Um, so that's just a quick definition so we can understand what it means when so we say South Africa is a settler colonial state um, or it becomes a settler colonial state. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Um, you can make use of the chat or the um, emoji features in on on this um on zoom okay thank you John. okay thank you john i appreciate it i really thrive off head nods and so it's hard not having my nonverbal cues but that's okay we'll forge ahead um very quickly because i i just really want to emphasize i had to jump through early south african history south africa's history does not begin with european explore exploration or with european settlement um there is a very i'm going to go back a second there is a very heterogeneous indigenous population. We have the San, we have the Khoi Khoi. We talked a little about that, a little bit about them. We have Tosa on the Eastern Cape. We have Zulu and KwaZulu Natal. And so they're already here when Dutch settler colonial, colonialists arrive in 1652. They were not intending to settle South Africa. It's what ends up happening. Eventually the British arrive too. Um, so what we have are two uh, European colonial powers vying for control of South Africa's land, labor, and resources. Um, this is also where we get the development of a, a colored population, and those are, you know, the results of unions between white settlers and indigenous or enslaved populations in South Africa. As we have these Dutch settler colonialists um, and their dependents, as well as, as well as the British expanding in South Africa, pushing the frontier. They're getting into skirmishes with uh, local populations. Um, sometimes there are loose packs formed um, and often local populations are forced into laboring for white, white settlers. Um, so it's a very contested space. 
um, but there's remarkable heterogeneity. Um, it's a very diverse society. And very quickly, um, as John mentioned, um, diamonds and gold are discovered in South Africa. This is revolutionary. Um, it brings fortune seekers from all over the world um, trying to cash in. Britain becomes more focused on South Africa as a colony, and it also establishes a migrant labor system. So this is basically black male sex mining compounds and I see something in the chat oh no okay will you let me know if it comes back oh back now thank you as soon as you said it it said my internet connection was unstable so thank you don't know what you heard but um migrant labor system men moving into into cities um and working for for under white people and women are left behind um, on the rural front, managing um, their homes, managing domestic labor, things like that. So um, yeah, we have the growth of the capitalist economy, urbanization, industrialization, deeply coinciding with the development of racial structures in the diamond and gold industries. So that's where we are. The, Brit, uh, um, the British, British eventually, Form the Union of South Africa. It essentially consolidates the region. They're able to do this with Afrikaners because both share in hostilities towards non-whites. Um, Afrikaners specifically have um, are, are imbibing this idea of uh, Afrikaner nationalism, which basically has this collective memory of suffering under the British, completely erases the indigenous population, um, and also. Um, invokes this idea of being God's chosen people and having a claim to the land, a righteous claim to the land. This is very similar to a concept in the United States. I don't know if anyone wants to put that in the chat, but um, yeah, just we've seen this before with um, settlers feeling entitled to the land and expanding because of that sense of righteous entitlement. Um, and no one put it in, but this is um, much like Manifest Destiny. So basically what happened, oh, here, maybe someone. Ma Wonderful, Michelle, excellent, extra credit or gold, I don't know what you teach. Maybe it's a gold, gold star but, um, or a pizza party. I, I don't know. I think students of all ages enjoy pizza parties. So um, excellent. Thank you, Michelle, for that um, Manifest Destiny. Um, um, uh, okay, so we are now Union of South Africa. British have seized control, basically, of, of South Africa at this point. They're implementing different policies. This is known as the segregationist era, by the way, the period before apartheid. And there are just two pieces of legislation I want to emphasize. The first is, hopefully, <laughs> The first is the Native Labor Regulation Act. These are just, these are passes. These are the pass laws. Passes are just identification documents. Um, they are designed to limit African migration into cities. Um, men needed permission um, from their employers in order to reside in those cities, um, specific, specifically African men. If you did not have a passbook, you could be subject to a fine, imprisonment, imprisonment, beatings, or you could be ejected from the city altogether. Um, and so this is part of also the migrant labor system, men moving into urban centers, women remaining behind in the rural economies. The Native Lands Act of 1913 reserves 7% of the land to Africans who are over 85% of the population. So we can visualize what that looks like. It's going to look like immense overcrowding. It's going to look like the spread of disease. It's gonna look like um, under-resourced communities. Um, they're also given the most infertile land. Um, and there are a few other stipulations attached to this, but for the most part, what's happening in the segregationist era is that Africans can't pay taxes and can't produce enough food. 
and child mortality is increasing. So all of this is happening um, in the early 20th century. So people don't just sit idly by and watch this happen. Unsurprisingly, we're getting unions um, in the 1920s. We're getting anti-pass protests. Women are often very involved in those. Uh, there's the rise of an informal economy to help better support African laborers. Um, but what I want to emphasize is the South African Native National Congress. This is what becomes the ANC um, in 1923, um, but in 1912, this is what it's called. So what you see on your screen is a, 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 a Black male middle class. These men, mission educated, they're Christians, they attended the best schools, they've adopted European styles and um, dress, uh, European uh, moral codes, they believe in ideals of social mobility. Um, however, we know that due to South Africa's uh, draconian racial policies, they're not really able to advance, um, even though that's what they're learning in school, is that they should be advancing. They're very frustrated. They're very disgruntled. So in 1912, they formed this organization to pressure South Africa into exalting their statuses, um, in exalting the statuses specifically of men, um, but in general, um, Africans and relaxing their draconian racial policies. This time women are not allowed to be members of the organization. That does not stop them from organizing. They're finding other um, organizations on their own uh, to do that work. So this is the context for Oliver Tombo, and I'm gonna check how we are on time. Okay, very good. Um, Oliver Tombo um, is born into um, a small farming community in 1917 in the Eastern Cape. He attends missionary schools, excels in his studies, enrolls in the U University of Fort Hare, which is also in the Eastern Cape. Critically, that's where he meets Nelson Mandela. Um, and this is a very formative relationship. While he's there, he's a bit of a troublemaker. Um, he leads, um, or what the, the authorities would see as a troublemaker because he's leading protests, student protests on campus, very disruptive. He ends up being expelled from Fort Hare in the early forties. Fortunately for us, this does not deter his activist streak. And in 1944, he founds what's known as the ANC Youth League. Uh, this is with M Nelson Mandela. This is important because we're seeing a generational split in the ANC. Um, the youth think that the old guard are not taking aggressive enough anti-segregationist approaches. Um, they think that the old guard is, is petitioning too much, it's too conciliatory, it's not disruptive enough. So the Youth League steps in, really pushing for civil disobedience. That means boycotts, it means strikes, it means actions that really grab the attention of the state. Um, similarly, um, Adelaide Hambo, she is born Adelaide Chukudu uh, in the Hoteng province of present day South Africa in 1929. She is politicized um, after a police raid when she's 10 years old. Uh, and essentially what happens is um, her grandfather is subjected to public humiliation by the police. It's a very formative experience for her. It's the catalyst for her political commitment to the struggle. So she ends up training as a nurse. It's one of the few occupations available um, to African women during this time. And in 1943, the ANC opens up its ranks to women. So in 44, she joins the ANC, specifically the Youth League that Oliver Tombo just founded with Nelson Mandela. Um, and she becomes a key organizer. Uh, she's elected to chairperson of her local branch um, and ends up meeting Oliver Tombo this way. So before we continue, um, is this making sense for people? Is this, are there any questions about this, about the context? Um, are we understanding the rise of anti-apartheid resistance in South Africa? Yes, this is making sense. Thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate the uh, 
Thank you, John. I love the validation. It's it's very helpful for me. Um, excellent. I'm very glad to hear that. We are we're jumping a lot of things, um, covering a lot. So let's do it. So we're gonna forge ahead. Um, we're jumping now to so we're in the 40s. So um, World War II is really important to understanding um, this narrative. Okay, we have another chat. <laughs> the visual feedback. You know what? That. I might, now I might be, I might tune in too much now. I'm like, if he's not head nodding, did I, am I not doing what I need to do? Do you understand? And that's very, I'm very conflicted on that. I think I really appreciate you saying that. I really do thrive on my head nods and I always have. So World War II. So um, I don't know if there are any US historians in here. World War II in the United States, we see, gets the U.S. out of the Great Depression. We see massive industrialization and women joining the labor force. Similar processes happen in South Africa because the war is not being fought on mainland South Africa, much like the war is not being fought on mainland United States. So um, this, oh, this occurs around here. Thank you, Michelle. You guys are making me feel so good today. That's, I feel good. I'm feeling good for 11.38 p.m. on a Wednesday night. So I really appreciate that. Um, so what's happening, this is just to help the comparisons. What's happening in the United States, very similar to what happens in South Africa. South Africa fights on the side of the allies. Makes sense. Britain is the one who, who created a union in South Africa. Um, but because there's a demand for wage labor to fuel the war effort, we see exponential increases in urbanization and industrialization. This includes African women. This includes colored people in South Africa. They are now entering manufacturing jobs, um, jobs in the service industry. Um, we see the rise of black wages often becoming higher than poor whites. And poor whites tended to be Afrikaners. Oh, and Afrikaners being the descendants of the Dutch settler colon colonialists in 1652. So um, the government also is not funding housing for these um, new, new, new people coming to urban areas. So we see what you see on the screen here are, are squatter settlements that turn into townships basically reservoirs of black labor near um, city centers. Um, you're seeing Alexandra Township in Johannesburg and to the right of it, a present day photo. Um, but we can see here how there's overcrowding, how there's gonna be crime and scarcity. Um, and that was just the, the, the lived reality of many South Africans living in these um, townships. Simultaneously, we're seeing the rise of, of trade unions, boycott strikes, and the government's relaxing past laws. Um, that's, you know, in order to satiate this demand for labor during the war period. Um, so this is becoming a problem for some, um, some white settlers in South Africa, specifically Afrikaners. So you might ask your students, I'm gonna ask you now, why is, this urbanization a problem at this time. Oh, right. And we're going to talk about that too. Um, and that's it's a good point, Michelle, is what has changed in South Africa since this time. And I'm going to say it now, by many estimates, the wealth between the rich and the poor has increased post-apartheid, um, which is is you know disconcerting. But it's true that that doesn't look like much has changed sometimes in some places. Um, sounds like the US. Yeah, definitely does. Um, absolutely does. Um, some things that seem like um, see, see, things that seem like they belong to a distant past are still very present and with us, especially when we study history. Yeah. Um, so I asked a question. I don't remember what it was. Let me look at my notes. Oh, okay. Here, um, I don't know if anyone's going to answer this. Um, there's a crisis here um, with Africans moving into the cities. That means that white people are, are losing control um, and they don't want to. They want to be able to control where Africans are going. They also want to maintain white supremacy in the region. 
this is what becomes the core issue in the 1948 elections. So um, these are the general elections in South Africa. I've, I'm very sparing with what I put on my slides. So, um, you know, hopefully this is making sense, but um, there we, in 1948, we have the national party, which is representing radical Afrikaners under Daniel Milan, who's up there. Um, they are campaigning on apartheid. Apartheid only means separateness or apartness in Afrikaans. Afrikaans being the simplified language of Dutch that Afrikaners predominantly speak. So that's all it means. It means separateness or apartness. Um, national Party is effectively mobilizing urban and rural support. Their chief rival is the Union Party. Just what you need to know about the Union Party is they're the business as usual um, party. They uh, are proponents of segregation, um, but the National Party wants to take it to extremes because there is so much um, anxiety among Afrikaners during this period. So 1948 general elections, Black South Africans can't vote. They're the majority of the population. The United Party, the one that is running on business as usual, wins almost 51% of the vote, um, of, of the popular vote. Uh, the National Party wins 41%. Um, it loses the popular vote, but it wins the general election in 1948. Now this confuses a lot of students, but probably less so than it did in year, previous years past because they will have a recent memory of a US election where a president won the popular vote, but lost the election. In South Africa, the United Party won the popular vote. Yes, 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 thank you, John. Um, why does this happen? Um, in South Africa at this time, in the Union of South Africa, um, the constitution essentially divides the country in a way that favors rural votes. Um, and Afrikaners are predominantly the rural voters. So it basically just has to do with the way um, the electorate is, is apportioned. Um, the reason why this is so significant is um, Afrikaners um, seize control of a region in which they are only 12% of the population. So this is white minor minority rule. Um, is that, okay, is that making sense um, how we get to this point um, in South African history? Click on the chat, thank you so much. Okay, very quick on the chat. Yes, thank you, Michelle. So um, your students, let's see how we are on time. Okay, I think we're okay. So, um, Let's talk about apartheid. I think that some of your students, depending on their ages, have probably heard of this term, um, but I'm guessing that they don't know, they don't have a, a, quite a, a deep understanding of it or what it means. Um, and apartheid basically has four key tenets. Um, the first one, check this chat. Oh, absolutely, absolutely does. Uh, geography matters, geopolitical, yes. Um, definitely a big determinant of, of elections, especially in South Africa. So um, four key tenets of apartheid. Um, there are four distinct racial groups. There are, are white people, colored people, Indian, and African. Um, because I couldn't really cover early South African history, Oh, yes, definitely. That's why I thought this conversation might unfold a little bit differently is because many of you have memories of the apartheid state, probably have memories of watching um, it transition to democracy. Um, so that's why I'm trying to give the basics here. So, um, you know, it can be repackaged for your students. Um, that's true, yeah. So, um, the reason why there's a sizable Indian population has to do with early South African history. Basically, the British import indentured servants from British India in 1860 for labor. Um, and after their contracts expire, many of them stay, open businesses, have families. So that's why we have um, Indian South Africans in South Africa. Um, okay, second key point. 
white people are legally empowered to have absolute control over the state. Um, there's really not a lot of sugarcoating of this. Um, third point, white interests prevail over black interests. And key contrast to the United States. The United States, um, you know, there's a ruling Plessy versus, versus Ferguson, separate but equal. Separate facilities are okay because they are essentially equal. We know that that's not true. In South Africa, it is separate, unequal, and that is totally okay. Um, there's no sugarcoating of that. Um, it is okay for the government to not provide equal facilities for subordinate races. The last one, um, the white racial group in South Africa forms a single nation. Africans, however, belong to several distinct nations. And I've included a map on the right of what those nations are. It's, it's kind of small. What you just need to see is the way that they've been um, um, shoehorned onto different plots of land in order to divide them. Why would you do this? I understand this is a question you ask your students, but I'm asking you, why would the government do that to the um, African um, demographic? Are you asking, ask the, uh, the question again? Oh, okay. So um, South, Af the South Africa um, divides Africans into different nations. Mm -hmm. why, why would you do that? Why not just say there are four distinct groups, one's white, one's Indian, one's colored. Why were Africans divided further? What do you think? I, I like what John said. Um, I, I would maybe add to that, would it be also, um, they would have taken a look at geography and how they would draw on those boundaries as to see who would get the most um, desirable land and uh, what have you. Yes, are oh, you all hitting them on the nose? That's exactly right. Um, first, um, you're right. Um, where they place Africans, where they place what's called Bantustans or homelands, the most infertile land. Uh, the most fertile land goes to white South Africans. Um, the, at, at best, white South Africans are 20% of the, the, the population and they're given 80% of the land. Um, so we can see it's a massive, massive land inequality. And to John's point, exactly divide and rule. This is a divide and conquer strategy. Africans are the majority of the population. Yes, distinctions between colored and African. So, um, and yes, uh, as John's saying, perceived local difference, differences cause ethnic divides between Africans, make them loyal to um, their particular polity, um, dividing a population that is the majority of the, of, 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 the, of, of the area. So Michelle, to your question, that is a great question because the, of the way race is classified in South Africa. Um, it is often visual, um, it's very arbitrary, but um, for our purposes, colored in this context, it refers to people who were children of white settlers in early African history who, um, who, who, had children with enslaved populations or indigenous people. So colored people are seen as having brown skin, lighter skin. Africans visually are seen as having darker skin. These are Xhosa, these are Zulu, these are people from Mozambique, um, from Madagascar who brought in as enslaved populations. So visually they're creating a gradient between the two, but colored really exposes the fiction of race. Um, because it's really hard to distinguish um, who your ancestors are and how that determines the way that you're classified in South Africa. Because it is visual, colored people are classified as African. Sometimes African people are classified as colored. So it gets really, really complicated. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But for the South African government, it's visual. Looking at it visual, who's ever looking at it at that point in time, that's determining um, your racial classification. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so let's talk. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on the slides so that we have more time, but Hendrik Vorwood Bar becomes the next prime minister of South Africa. He is just considered um, the architect of apartheid. Oh yeah, that's great, Octoroon. Oh, and the way, it, also in Louisiana too, how we get these complex categorizations of race, particularly in New Orleans, but largely in Louisiana, is like to differentiate what percentage of, of blackness do you have in your blood? Yeah, that's a great, great point, John. Thank you. <laughs> no, but you're like giving very thorough answers. So I really appreciate it. It's um it's too bad that we couldn't be in a room together because then this would um function much more smoothly. But yeah, I think also to John's point, this is pointing to that all the parallels between South Africa and US history. And um a lot of students get excited about history when they can make comparisons between, you know, where they're from. And these two places are ripe for co contrast and um, comparison and contrast. Okay, so just the point about Hendrik Vorward, he's considered the architect of apartheid, pretty um, blatant, undisguised racism, um, fear mongering about basically black South Africans taking over and marginalizing everybody else. Okay. What makes apartheid apartheid? Um, so there's some early apartheid legislation that I just, I wanna cover a few of them just so that um, for your students, they can see what did this look like on the ground? Um, what, did it, what did it mean to implement um, apartheid policies? So we have prohibition of mixed marriages, basically illegal for people of any different races to marry. We have the Immorality Act, which um, forbade uh, sex between white people and people of different races. Um, the Population Registration Act, this is your official classification um, under the law. And let's go back to Michelle's question about how are they classifying people. In the United States, we have the, the one drop rule. Um, again, this, this looks complicated in some places like in Louisiana, but in general, you know, you have one drop of black ancestry in your blood, you are black. In South Africa, um, appearance is, is a little more complicated. It's, it's language is spoken, it's who your parents are, um, it's, it's how you look. There's a lot of wiggle room here and latitude in determining race. Um, sometimes they have the brown bag test. They hold it up to your face, compare complexions, Sometimes it's the pencil test. They stick a pencil in your hair to determine the te texture of your hair. These are all so arbitrary. And I don't know if any of you have been to South Africa, but the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg has these huge plaques on the wall where it just lists the number of people who essentially change race from one year to the next because it's, it's just this arbitrary system. Um, and it, it just exposes the fiction of race and that it's this social construct, but um, people are changing races, changing races um, as apartheid officials deem fit over the years. And Group Areas Act determines where you live based on race. Um, number five is just about separate and unequal facilities. Uh, the Bantu Education Act is designed to limit the education of Black South Africans. And, you know, education is seen as a threat um, to the apartheid state because it gives people the intellectual tools to challenge their oppressors. So they basically want to ensure that Black South Africans are indoctrinated and, and, and taught to um, provide labor for white South Africans for the majority of their lives. So it's about teaching them to be subservient. This kind of has an opposite effect in that this actually expands the number of people going to school. Um, more children start going to school under this. And even though um, South African authorities are trying to control the curriculum, you always have teachers pushing back. You have teachers um, who are who are challenging that curriculum, who are giving um, lectures or, or 
um, otherwise instilling other ideas that um, are considered subversive to the apartheid state. Um, but again, these facilities and these schools are much more underfunded um, and have fewer resources. The last one here just has to do with the, the Bantu stunts that we were talking about where you know Africans were further divided. The intention is that these will eventually be independent. The, um, the apartheid government does this, claims Bantu stunts will be independent in order to avert criticisms, but it's really nominal independence and no foreign sovereign nation really ever recognizes the Bantu stunts. So there's just some pictures to see what this looked like on the ground. Um, we're learning about past books, migrant labors, migrant labor, forced removal, forced removals in order to maintain racial separation. That means Black South Africans are uprooted and taken to townships, to homelands. Um, we see rates of disease and poverty skyrocket. Um, there's inferior education and healthcare being provided to um, Black South Africans specifically. We also have indiscriminate police raids, violence, um, indefinite detention. So um, all of this is occurring under um, the apartheid government with the intention of creating a cheap supply of black labor, of compliant workers um, so that white society can prosper. And this, I mean, this works to some degree. In 1980, uh, the World Bank surveys 90 countries and South Africa is found to have the most inequitable distribution of income. Okay, so does that, do you think, does that uh, make sense up to this point? What, what apartheid is and what is happening on the ground and what those experiences might look like? Yep, okay, good, we love yeps. All right, excellent. Um, yes, in all caps, that's even better. So thank you. Um, yeah, Michelle, I also have to say, I love the um, the screen uh, saver that you have on here, social studies lady, I think it says. It, I noticed it when it came up. Such Claire Pell, yes, so many. Like I can even touch on it here, but there's so many many parallels to the US. Um, and I think the, the social studies curriculum for sixth and seventh graders, I looked at it, was talking about how do you compare, you know, different, histories and different societies and South Africa and the US are ripe for comparison. Um, okay, let's get back to, that's just setting the context for apartheid. Um, the 1950s are a very decisive decade for the ANC. Um, at this point in time, Oliver and Nelson Mandela set up a law, law firm in Johannesburg. They're partners. Um, they get a lot of clients coming to them. They are also helping facilitate wave a wave of dissent going on because uh, the apartheid government is implementing all of these repressive um, policies. So in the 1950s, the ANC launches a defiance campaign. It is basically mass civil disobedience. You can see it there on the bottom of your screen of, of people entering into European only facilities. Uh, the apartheid government doesn't really listen to their demands, which is to repeal discriminatory legislation. However, the ANC's membership skyrockets to 10,000. Um, before there weren't that, you know, there weren't that many people who were members of the ANC. At this point, the ANC becomes more of a mass movement. Uh, also in 1955, um, they drop the Freedom Charter. So the Freedom, the ANC does this with um, a cluster of, of other people known as the C Congress of the People. Um, all that means for us is that it is a collective of different political organizations representing um, all the different races in South Africa. So this is basically a multiracial gathering of people with the ANC. Um, it articulates um, their policy statement, the rights and freedoms they're demanding, socialist ideas. But its most controversial statement is South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black or white. So could ask your students and I'm gonna ask you, why would that statement be so controversial that South Africa belongs 
to all who live in it, black or white. Well, they've just spent years, some years uh, organizing it to take it away from people, mm -hmm. um, for one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is very good. You're right. And you're right, John, that it doesn't um, articulate all the other um, people who are involved in this process. Um, we do have Indians and we do have colored South Africans represented at the Congress, but it does kind of simplify the two. Um, and um, basically, uh, it is also a power sharing agreement with people who are the oppressors. Um, it doesn't demand that white South Africans are expelled. Um, it doesn't advocate for a black revolution. It says it is going to be a multiracial country and we're all gonna share in the wealth, noting the fact that it doesn't specify coloreds and Indians as well, but they are represented at this Congress. Okay, very, very good. Okay, so all that is going on, ANC is causing mass uproar um, in South Africa, um, mass dissent. Um, and the apartheid government, oh, let me go back for a slide. Um, the apartheid government also tries to expend past laws to women. And so we have a 20,000 strong women's march um, in South Africa. Adelaide Tombo helps to um, organize this, um, but it is a, a, a very, this is in 1956. It is a, a huge demonstration of the potent political force of women. Um, it's a multiracial gathering of, of 20,000 women opposed to the extension of past laws to African women. I just wanted to include that. So because of all, we have all of this organizing in the 50s um, in res response to apartheid legislation, um, the government um, puts 156 people on trial for treason. Oliver Tambo is implicated in this for a second, and this goes on for five years, um, this trial. So it seems like Oliver Tambo might have to postpone his wedding, but he is let out on bail. Um, wedding goes as planned with Adelaide Tambo. They have three children together. Um, they decide that one person is gonna take on the, the political struggle full time, and another one is gonna struggle part-time, but also care for the family. And that's what Adelaide, Tam Adelaide Tambo, um, her task ends up being. But she famously says to her children, remember, your father did not introduce me to the struggle. I was already in it when I met him. Um, and the reason why I just want to talk, I wanted to mention this is because South Africans are not just um, unwavering activists, uh, who are also wholeheartedly suffering. They fall in love, they have families, they built community, um, they found different forms of labor, all these things that the apartheid state just couldn't wholeheartedly crush. Um, so I just wanted to mention that about um, Oliver and uh, Adelaide Tambo and their, their wedding. I was gonna do a poll everywhere. There's not that many of us, so I'm not going to. I think we could just, you would type your answers into the chat but Oliver gets married, he's still on trial for treason. There's 156 of them. Knowing what you know about the apartheid state, you might ask your students to make conjectures. Um, and that's what I'm asking you. What do you think the outcome was? Was everyone found guilty? Uh, with some with harsh punishments, was everyone, um, do you think everyone uh, was found not guilty or acquitted? A mix of guilty? mix of acquitted, what do you think? Okay, guilty, John's guess is everyone's, everyone is found guilty, it sounds like, is what you're saying. Okay, guilty, Michelle. I don't know if Stephanie wants to put chime in here, but um, I think these are good guesses given what we know about the um, apartheid state. Um, <clears throat> anyway, 156 of the most influential people in the struggle are on trial and the government rules that 156 of them are not guilty. That shocks a lot of students. How, why, how? Um, we don't have, I don't have a lot of time to go. I wanna jump to some other things, but basically 
there is a political organization that develops to specifically fund political prisoners on trial and their families. Um, it ends up being banned, so it becomes an international organization in London, um, but it funnels 150 million British pounds into the anti-apartheid struggle. That is a huge sum of money, and it's very effective at providing political defense to these prisoners, um, which is why this outcome, it was, and also just to instill in your students, the shock of this outcome and how elated people must have been to have heard this verdict. Okay, so just a cool little aside about the treason trial. Um, so, let's see, fascinating for the role of Yes, this is, this is because appearances matter in South Africa figuratively um, and, and literally. Uh, part of the reason why this, the apartheid state is able to defend itself is because it gives the illusion of representation. And in some inadvertent ways, people then have access to that representation. So it kind of shows the limits of the apartheid power during this time, things that are unintended consequences, which is a huge facet of history too, is just unintended consequences. Um, great, great. Um, okay, so very quickly, let me, let me check how much time we have. Okay, so I think we are doing good. I'm going to, potentially speed up some things. Um, there is a rival liberation organization that splits off from the, a the ANC. Um, it's called the Pan-Africanist Congress. It is more explicitly African nationalism. But in 1960, um, it stages an anti-pass protest. Um, and it is brutally put down by the apartheid state. That picture on the left is a famous, famous image of the, ma of the Sharpeville massacre in 1960. Um, 69 people are killed, countless others injured. Many people have bullets in their backs because they're running away. Um, and in response to this, the, the apartheid state institutes a state of emergency. State of emergency is just an escalation of repressive measures in order to, um, to quell unrest and restore a status quo. Um, so, this, they end up, um, apartheid authorities end up banning the ANC. They ban the ANC Women's League. They ban the PAC, which was responsible for the protest. In addition to all the arrests, um, curfews implemented, things like that. Um, this is a huge deal. After this moment, the struggle moves underground. Um, it's temporary, but for right now, the struggle has to move underground. Um, ANC sees the writing on the wall. Oh yeah, it's super interesting course facts. I don't know so much about that after the Boston Tea Party, but if you would like to put in the group chat the details, because I probably knew that at some point in time and I don't now. Um, but I actually, I honestly love the, the comparisons you're making with the um, US history because there are ample um, opportunities to make comparisons between the two. Um, so yeah. Um, ANC sees the writing on the wall, asks the Tombos to go into exile in 1960 because people are being arrested and detained. Um, and so that's what they do. I just have a quick aside here about what happens internally in South Africa. Um, you know, the ANC decides to embrace the violence as a tactic. Um, it doesn't take this decision lightly. It um, is basically a proponent of sabotage which is um, targeting government installations um, and deliberately avoiding civilian life. That doesn't always happen, but that's the intention. Um, but at this point in time, many activists are fugitives and Nelson Mandela is trying to evade the authorities. Question for you all, someone tips off where Nelson Mandela is in South Africa. Um, Anyone want to take a guess? It is not a person and it is not an entity that exists in South Africa. And I think this is be a question your students will enjoy guessing, but who do you think tipped off 
where Nelson Mandela was in South Africa. U.S. government, great guess, and that's exactly what it, where it, it's the CIA. CIA tells the apartheid authorities where Nelson Mandela is. And, um, you know, this isn't a, a presentation that centers Nelson Mandela, but it is important to recognize the way the US government is also involved in apartheid policies, in supporting the apartheid state. Why would they do this? Um, this is in the middle of the Cold War. And, um, you know, they're opposing the rise of communism. And one way, that the apartheid government legitimizes itself is claiming that it is staving off a communist takeover of the country. So a movement that is for nationalism, that is for self-determination is framed as, as uh, communist, communist puppets, basically. Um, and that is why the US government, uh, along with its own problematic race, racist views, uh, that is why it tells the authorities where Nelson Mandela is. And so he's put on trial and he goes to prison for 27 years. So checking our time. Okay. okay. So um, Oliver Tambo goes um, abroad and starts mobilizing international audiences pretty much immediately. And, you know, you it is exhaustive work. He is globe trotting like no one's business. He is going to Tanzania, he's going to Kenya, Tunisia, Vietnam, Soviet Union, Canada, USA. He's he's going all over. Um, he's meeting with ANC members, anti-apartheid supporters, sometimes the PAC, the rival liberation movement, but his permanent home is in London. And I have a picture for, um, for you on the right here. He exits South Africa first. Adelaide Tambo and their children join him a few months later. Um, and Adelaide Tambo is very interesting in the way that she both um, is emblematic of, of dynamics of gender and an exception to them because many exiles who go abroad, including, including women, can't take their children with them. Uh, they end up leaving, leaving their children behind in South Africa, leaving them with relatives and other caregivers. So Adelaide has her children with her, so that's pretty exceptional. Um, but she is also, she also has to work. Um, and so she's taking care of her children. She's taking up shifts as a work, uh, as a nurse. Uh, she's simultaneously supporting other exiles who go to London. Um, she's funding them, providing housing. She's also finding, founding um, solidarity organizations and, um, otherwise um, doing work for the ANC. So this is something that we see time and time again in South Africa, as well as with women exiles. It is the way that women are tasked with looking after the welfare of multiple people. Um, they're the ones with maintaining standards of living, um, with ensuring that there's, you know, people are maintaining their, their, their livelihoods, and those responsibilities are often delegated to women. So even though Adelaide Tambo is not as public facing as Oliver Tambo in exile, the work she does as well as the work of other women exiles are very critical to the functioning of the ANC as a liberation movement. Um, so for um, Oliver, 1967, he becomes president of the ANC, the official torchbearer of the ANC in exile um, and is doing the majority of international campaigning for the movement, um, at least as its leading figure. So um, if we have, I'm going to skip the next part, but basically he gives a speech to the UN and one assignment I like to give students is um, have them prepare their own speech to the UN. Um, in what way, how would you lobby or petition the UN and appeal to, to the agency to intervene in the affairs of South Africa. And I like to give them that assignment before they've read Oliver Tambo actually, just so that they can see, they can have their own um, contribution and then see how, how did another South African do it? Oh, thank you, I'm glad, I'm glad you think so. We're not doing that right now. You, you all could, I'm sure do that in your sleep. So just a few things I wanna emphasize, the ANC is doing 
to um, further promote the, the movement and to mass mobilize. Um, remember the ANC turns to violence and now has an armed wing called Mkanto We Seize Way, also known as MK. So you don't have to remember that, just know it's MK. Um, they are getting support from the Soviet Union for this armed wing. Um, however, it's large, its influence actually tends to be more symbolic um, than actual physical sabotage. Uh, its first military operation is a complete failure um, by pretty much all accounts. Um, it is a, a resounding failure um, in 1967. We don't need to go into the details of this, but they are putting um, a lot of money, education, training into MK. They also have a propaganda wing, so they have Radio Freedom. If this wasn't Zoom, I would play a clip of Radio Freedom. However, I have been chastised before for putting in sound and video into Zoom. Apparently, it doesn't translate well um, on these sessions, so I will spare you the trouble of listening to a Radio Freedom broadcast. Um, but the ANC is doing this almost nightly um, in Zambia, which is where um, their headquarters are located for the majority of the struggle. Oh, it also it has um, um, an underground publication called Sashaba, um, more propaganda. Um, and just interestingly, um, Sashaba is not always like, it's not very accessible in South Africa. Sashaba is more accessible in the United States, which actually points to the power dynamics of doing history, but I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, so yeah, the ANC is doing all of this work um, and there's also, also often internal disputes um, within the organization itself and different sorts of accusations of malfeasance. So it's struggling through all of this um, for the purposes of time. Okay, we're gonna jump through some things. 1976 is a critical year for the ANC um, and in South Africa. Steve Beagle on the left of your screen is the progenitor of this idea called black consciousness, which is all about liberating black psyches from oppression. Um, and it's about black reliance and black uplift. Um, it renounces white allyship, um, but it inspires a generation of students. Now remember, in South Africa, the struggle is underground, but what happens is the apartheid government implements Afrikaans as a language of instruction, and, you know, Afrikaans is the simplified form of Dutch that Afrikaners speak. This is hugely um, hugely infuriating because Afrikaans is seen as the medium of, of as, a, as a tool of oppressors. Um, so using it as a medium of instruction is just adding insult to injury. So middle schoolers and high school students plan a march to protest implementing Afrikaans as a medium of instruction and the police open fire. The image on your right is also a very, very famous image from the Soweto, up, what is known as the Soweto Uprising. Hector Peterson, Hector Peterson is the 12 year old boy who was shot by police. This image circulates um, internationally and there it's, it's generating so much attention on South Africa and so much criticism. Um, so, um, in response to this, many of these young activists go into exile and the ANC incorporates a lot of them into their ranks. Uh, and, you know, sometimes there are generational tensions, but it's leading to the, the it led to the creation of a school, um, the training of this new crop of ANC members. So um, also the apartheid government claims that these uprisings, um, the one in 1960 and 76 were directed by Moscow and communists. Um, and I just want to emphasize, like, it is true, the Soviet Union and its satellite states were supporting third world countries um, against Western imperialism. Uh, they're supplying arms to resistance movements. They're the number one arms supplier to the ANC. Um, they're providing military uh, education and training. And there are even communists within the ranks of the ANC, but it is not a puppet of the Soviet Union. 
um, and is not completely beholden to, to, um, to it at all. And in fact, we can see how the ANC plays Western countries and Soviet Union, the Soviet Union to its advantage. Okay, so I'm gonna start jumping very quickly now because I've been talking far too long. These are the companies that are investing in South Africa, South Africa um, in the West. South Africa is very indispensable to the world economy at this time. $26.3 billion of foreign capital is invested in South Africa in 1978. Um, and so these companies are helping support uh, the, the apartheid regime financially. This leads to the tumultuous 1980s, <clears throat> people demanding that they boycott apartheid, um, promoting sports boycotts. Really interesting. I just want to tell you, because I think it's so funny, um, the rugby tournament. That's how people are often protesting South Africa's rugby team from going abroad and playing. And in New Zealand in, 19, in the 1980s, anti-apartheid supporters throw glass shards all over the rugby um, field to prevent them from playing. So there's really funny footage of officials looking around trying to pull out all these shards from people who are trying to prevent um, the game from starting. Um, anyway, we also have students uh, forming, um, or we have students protesting universities that are investing in South Africa. We have cultural boycotts too, like Artists Against Apartheid. Um, and the image on your left is just uh, a tribute to Nelson Mandela on his birthday at Wembley Stadium in England, which Oliver Tombo, the ANC, helps orchestrate, orchestrate to make Nelson Mandela a household name. They needed somebody to rally around, and that was through deliberate political maneuvering. Um, so Nelson Mandela doesn't just, you know, Nelson Mandela doesn't become huge for any old reason. It is the product, product of deliberate strategizing. Within South Africa, that's the United Democratic Front. You don't have to remember that name. Just know there's a mass democratic movement trying to render South Africa ungovernable through boycotts, strikes, work stayaways, um, things like that. Good to have. Yes, that is an excellent point, John. Um, and one way that I sometimes frame this to students is the struggle went underground and suddenly became above ground in 1976 by through a certain contingent of people. Try to have them guess, it's kind of a little vague, but it's them, it's students, students who are their age, who are pioneering different ways of opposing the apartheid government. It's very inspirational. Um, but yeah, and then you, we kind of initiate conversation about why are students such a potent political force to tap into? Um, so yeah, yeah, definitely students and students identify with this um, so much um, because they're activists in other ways. Um, so just so the government, um, the 80s are so tumultuous, so much is going on. South Africa institutes another state of emergency. But basically a big turning point, um, if we had more time, I would ask you all, but um, 1989, the Berlin Wall falls. And this is a huge problem for the apartheid government because if you recall, a part, uh, the apartheid regime has been defending itself by claiming it is, it is preventing a communist takeover. And with the fall of the Soviet Union, it can no longer fall back on that. Um, so it is not a coincidence that after the Berlin Wall falls, um, Nelson Mandela is released from prison. Um, there's a ban, um, the ban on the ANC, the Pan-Africanist Congress are removed. Um, so this is a major, major turning point um, in the anti-apartheid movement. <clears throat> it also means that the Tambos can come back to South Africa. They've spent 30 years abroad um, campaigning for the ANC. And this took a huge toll on Oliver Tambo's health. He has two strokes. Um, he can no longer carry on his duties as president. So um, Nelson Mandela takes over. There's a process of nego negotiations. Many people thought there was going to be a bloody transition to democracy. Um, South Africa is embroiled in a civil war in the um, 1980s and 1990s. There's so much political violence that's escalating. 
and the ANC and the National Party, um, which is currently being led by F.W. de Klerk, he's on the bottom right of your screen, um, they negotiate a peaceful transfer of power. And that's also why they win the Nobel Peace, they both win the Nobel Peace Prizes. <clears throat> so fortunately, <clears throat> Nelson, uh, um, Oliver Tambo's health declines, he passes away in 1993, suffers a heart attack. Just like many South Africans before him, he didn't live to see South Africa's transition to democracy. Um, <clears throat> but ANC rules, um, um, ANC wins South Africa's first democratic elections. Nelson Mandela is elected president. <clears throat> um, Adelaide Tambo um, works in par parliament for a little bit. Many other revolutionary leaders do the same. They transition to statecraft. Um, she wins numerous awards for her involvement in the struggle. Um, and she's very active in community engagement. She passes away um, in January of 2007. So we don't really have that much time left. Um, usually I like to ask students, how do you heal a country? How do you facilitate reconciliation? How do you heal these deep-seated racial divides? It gives them something to think about. <clears throat> I just wanna leave you with the fact that um, South Africa had a Truth and Re Reconciliation Com Commission intended to expose crimes under apartheid. It's very controversial. No one is ever prosecuted for their crimes um, under apartheid once the ANC takes power. So it's, it's, it, it's very um, controversial. Um, but to go back to some of our questions from the beginning, perhaps in thinking about the causes of apartheid, if we had time to talk about South Africa's early history, how, you know, students, I like to get students to think about how far back can we go into thinking about why apartheid was implemented? Um, and then they can debate among, amongst each other what things were most effective in challenging the regime. And of course, what you all have been doing so remarkably, comparing and con contrasting South Africa, specifically with the US, which is so right for comparison. So thank you. That's exactly what I'm hoping this presentation would do. We also, I also like to ask students, you know, what do you think, what are the legacies of the movement? Um, what are new challenges? Because South Africa's story doesn't end here. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to, um, you know, apartheid persists infrastructurally, um, and structurally, new problems emerge. Um, but for right now, I'm, I'm going to end it here. Um, and hopefully you can get students thinking about all the complexities of African history. So um, if you want to email me anything, questions or whatever, that's my email up there. If you have criticisms, don't send them to me, send them to John, I don't want them. I just, I'm just kidding. You can email me anything. Um, I kind of flew through at the end there. I didn't have a lot of room for questions, but thank you for all your participation. I don't know if there are any lingering questions, but did hopefully didn't want to make a stay over time. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. That was really fantastic and impressive to cover so yeah. much history. I know you feel like you're rushed because you're a professional historian, um, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, you really did a, a really lovely job covering an incredible amount of history, and I really appreciate um, your ability to also really focus this around an individual story while giving all the context and, and really helping to make what is some hard history um, come alive through through an individual or a couple's story, not just an individual story, especially one who, though famous um, in a world context, uh, quite lesser known uh, in the US context. Um, so thank you so much. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, unsharing your screen oh, yeah. um, and then I can uh, go ahead and uh, share mine so that we can um, also go through uh, the remaining slides. Um, but I also, uh, another thing I just wanted to note um, is that um, I've, I've, I've worked with some educators, I've heard rumor through parents and, and others um, who when um, wanting to build empathy or, or make the comparison and the contrast, um, make that personal connection to the history for their students um, might be um, swayed by the idea of like doing a reenactment uh, in their classroom. And I was especially thinking about that when you showed the um, image of uh, what
very much. And and I think you by by focusing on the stories that you focused on, you helped uh, show a different way to reach students that wouldn't rely on um, what would be a really problematic way to try to build empathy. That that you can highlight people's stories, you can highlight their humanity in the midst of the challenges that they face and not have to rely on something that um, would be uh, highly problematic, uh, I think, both as a parent and as an educator um, for uh, that would reinforce power dynamics rather than um, create the opportunities for the education that you're going for. So with that, I'm going to um, get off my spiel uh, and um, hopefully get back to sharing my screen. Um, you, folks can uh, feel free to drop into the chat uh, what their uh, aha moment was uh, or uh, shout it out. Um, but uh, also want to, um, especially folks who might be watching this later, um, Please do stay connected uh, with all of us at UNC, uh, but especially if this topic is of interest to you, um, connecting with Ada, my colleague uh, at the Africa Studies Center. Um, and of course, uh, as Laura has so thoughtfully showed us, um, most topics, as a geographer, I would argue all topics uh, cross spatial lines and are not just located uh, in one location. And so um, an opportunity to, uh, across this whole week, think about the ways in which, um, even if you're not teaching specifically um, African history, um, uh, if you're in a global history class or just whatever kind of class you're in, Thinking about those spatial connections, I, again, representing European Studies Center, Europe's history, uh, and as we saw, the U.S.'s history is deeply tied uh, to the history of South Africa. Um, so uh, Ada is a great resource, uh, as all of our, res our centers are uh, on any of the topics um, and more. Um, and of course, the real resources uh, are our uh, amazing partners uh, at uh, NCDPI. Um, so their uh, information is available uh, there. Um, so uh, tomorrow's session uh, will begin uh, at 6 p.m. again. Um, this is another opportunity to kind of think across uh, global areas, uh, a resilience in Francophone Caribbean literature. Um, and so uh, French literature, uh, but recognizing uh, the global context of uh, Francophone speakers um, and Francophone literature. So thank you all so much again uh, for joining us. Uh, for those of you watching after the fact, thank you for taking the time. Um, please uh, go ahead. You can here's the link go.unc.edu slash Tombo uh, to uh, register your attendance. Um, and uh, that is the end of the 